Auckland, New Zealand is the unlikely location for one of the most dramatic rescues ever attempted. What began as a routine errand for a mother and her daughter ended up as an amazing story of courage, determination, and survival. Much of what you see was actually taped as events unfolded on August 9, 1990. That night we were driving down the road to Manukau City to the shopping centre. And then I missed the, the turn off. So I stopped. I was just dropping them off. Okay, just over there. I'll see you then. Bye. Among the girls was 12 year old Shirley Young, Gaylene's only child. David Perra spotted her in the parking lot as he was leaving his car. The kid yells out, Mum, wait, you know. I took notice of it because I know the car is not supposed to sit out there. This was instant, the minute it had it. It was the car that blew up first. All the petrol spilling out of the tank. And I thought, the tank is going to go any minute. No. Oh. Three eight one, multiple calls to car versus petrol tanker. Rescue units from the Manukau Fire Station were immediately dispatched to the scene, including station officer Graham Haycock. I said to my driver, where exactly is that corner? And he said to me, Graham, look straight ahead. And sure enough, there it was. It was a fire that just kept on going and going and going. Senior firefighter Roy Kennedy was among the first rescue workers on the scene. At this stage, you couldn't see the truck. You couldn't see a car. All there was was a huge ball of fire. It was mind-blowing. It was just awesome. With the help of the tanker's driver, David had found Gaylene and managed to pull her from the fiercely burning car. She's just screaming her head off and she's crying. I'll never ever want to live through that again. Never ever. We could only get within approximately 30 feet of the tanker because of the intensity of the heat. There was a river of fuel on fire running into the shopping centre. While I was looking around, I found a woman in the car park lying there, very badly burned. I knew I had to get water on those burns. All she said was, my baby, my baby's in the car. I assumed that the baby was dead. There was an ambulance on the way. I grabbed Roy and said, come on. And we started towards the back of the tanker. The heat was becoming even greater. The swirling smoke was down to ground level, hiding everything. And for a split second, I just looked at the fire. And instantly, I saw it, just for a second, a hand in the smoke. There was someone there, right under the tanker. Royd took off. He was heading straight into the fire. And under the truck, there's this child crushed by a big wheel. I could feel her feet protruding from under the tire where her, her limbs had been broken and doubled back. 
she was really scared. Mind you, so was I. But I let her know that I wasn't going to leave her, no matter what. At that point, I'd lost sight of him. I thought I'd lost him. Next minute, Roy yelled out, cover me, Graham, which was uh, the biggest relief I'd ever heard. He was still alive. All of a sudden, fire just flashed through. I thought it was all over. I really did. And water suddenly beat the flames off us. give some protection to where Royd was in the wreckage. We had to move guys into a position where they were exposed to danger. Divisional officer Ray Warby was in charge at the scene. Shirley was lucky because she was in the only part of that wreckage where any person could survive. It was being sheltered by the chassis and the trailer unit. Among the more than 100 rescue workers who converged on the accident site was paramedic Grant Pennycook. The big question was, how were we going to get her out? The decision was to raise the wheel assembly with the airbags. How long it was going to take was anyone's guess. Whether we would get her out or alive was once again uh, anyone's guess. itself was just so freezing, it's unbelievable. They had tried to bring in a sheet to give us some protection. I was continually talking to her, keeping her going. Have you ever been horse riding? When you get out of here, we're going to go horse riding. It's hard to imagine the injuries she was suffering from, and yet she was not crying. She was a battler, and it's a great thing to draw your own reserves of strength from when you've got someone like that next to you, who's only 12 years old. The firefighters were roasting, but they didn't back off, they just stood their ground. I was so astounded at the tenacity of my men. Time was ticking by. She suddenly started to fade away and she looked at me with big brown eyes and she looked at me and said, if I don't make it, tell my mother I love her. She just lay her head back and started to go unconscious. A resuscitator was passed in under the truck and I started keeping her alive. Shirley had been trapped under the burning truck for more than 40 minutes in the intense heat and fumes. The vehicle lifted slightly, three or four inches, but not enough to pull her out because she was crushed right down onto the road. But we were then able to get a further lift by using a hydraulic ram. I couldn't get out of there quick enough. She was away, which is an immense relief. To 
as soon as she was on that strip, she knew too that she was safe, finally, and she just stripped it away. After the rescue was completed, the fire just went out, just like that. Poof. And I felt as if the devil had backed off now that Shirley had been removed from the fire. Right, right, honestly, I just haven't got time. I'm so cold and I just, I'm dizzy and I just want to lie down. Roy did what I hope any firefighter would have done. But I wouldn't ask any firefighter to do it. He heard a cry for help and he responded at extreme danger to himself. He probably was a fool for climbing under there. I think we're all fools. But you don't think of those things when, when something like that happens, you know? I got home that night and uh, I just cried. Yeah. Twelve-year-old Shirley Young had suffered second and third degree burns over 20% of her body. Both legs were badly broken. One so badly, it had to be amputated. She and her mother spent months in the hospital recovering from their injuries. When Roy comes to get me, he said he was going to take me horse riding. When did he tell you that? When I was under the truck, I think. And that's what you're looking forward to the most? Yeah. Right, now you gotta lift up yourself. Five months after the accident, Roy kept his promise. Okay. Here, hang on to the driving pad. Oh. Will you stand in the oh. Roy and Shirley have grown very close, but she remembers little of the night a very brave man was willing to sacrifice his life to save her. He was there for me when I needed him. Okay, that's it, you're rocking and rolling. That's good, that's good movement. All he saw was this little girl's hand, and he didn't think twice, he just went in. Everyone else that was there were heroes, but he was up a bit more. Because if she had to go, I don't think he would have left her. I think he would have given his life. So many people can learn from that child about what she went through. Her inner strength, her character. She's a million dollars, that, that kidding. We haven't heard the, the last of her yet. In Belgium, in Belgium, the lives of a family are about to be changed forever by a brush with death. A brush that will leave them quite literally hanging in the balance. It is a beautiful summer day, June 1st, 1989, in the charming countryside Belgian city of Liège. Guy Cheslan is excited. He has brought home the brand new trailer he has bought for the family's upcoming vacation in the south of France. The interior is comfortable. Pascal, 17, and her brother Jean-Philippe, 11, beg their father to try it out. Guy finally gives in to their request to take the trailer out for a short spin. Guy takes it on the highway in order to test it out before the trip. For Guy Cheslan, it is a critical first for him.
he has never driven a car with a trailer attached to it. At the same time, Christian van der Velt is driving his tractor trailer heading towards the German border. As he spends more time with his trailer in tow, Guy becomes less and less confident. It is very difficult to control. I was driving to Germany and I saw the car with the trailer heading in the opposite direction towards Liège. I saw the car and the trailer start to zigzag from left to right. Just like a driver trying to correct a skid, Guy accelerates, but the trailer simply swings more and more out of control. Where is he going? He's going to jump the divider. He tries desperately to bring it back into line. Incredibly, the car is suspended nearly a hundred feet in the air, held only by the trailer hitch. Each passing moment increases the likelihood that the car will snap from the hitch and plunge from the overpass, crashing onto the highway below. Christian van der Velt stops his truck immediately. He runs across four lanes of traffic, risking his own life to reach the strangers in the hanging car. Are there any kids? Are there any kids? Yes, there are two. Don't move. Don't move at all. I'm coming right back. Inside the car, it is a living hell. The smallest movement or breath could send the car toppling into the abyss. In the back, Jean-Philippe and his sister Pascal are getting hysterical. Without a moment to spare, Christian takes matters into his own hands. inside, four people, get a rope. With the help of a strap, he tries to attach the car to the guardrail. He is joined by other truck drivers. Will the strap hold? Don't worry, we'll get you out of there. What is going on? There's four people inside. What? Four people, two kids and two adults. After we finished tying the car, which is the first thing we did, because we were afraid it would fall since, you know, uh, how can I say, the trailer hitch was broken on one side and the other side was just barely holding, you know, just so-so. There, here's the rope. Catch the rope! Tie it around your waist. Make sure it's tight. Make a double knot. Did you tie it well? Is it tight? Yes. Okay, now, don't be scared. Be careful, be careful, okay? We do the same thing for the second one. Same for the second one! Don't look down! Look 
regardez pas vers le bas. Don't look down. Je me disais vraiment que c'était. I really thought it was the end, you know. You tell yourself unbelievable things, you know, things I'd never thought I could ever say, like, Daddy, Mommy, we're gonna die, goodbye, things like that. At first it was such a big relief just to be back on Earth. I told all the people who were there, save my parents, save my parents. So the two people left? Yeah. Make it solid enough? What do you tie to the hitch? Yeah, I did. The frame too, and the other side. Christian and the rescuers are frustrated by their inability to get the adults out of the car. They'll have to wait. I see this crane coming in the opposite direction and I tell the policeman, there's a crane, what are we waiting for? Because you know, are we waiting for the car to fall or what? It's a spectacular misadventure, I'd say, because of, uh, of the risk to the people. In our job, we're used to seeing the accident happen and the injured. In this case, we had to make sure they did not injure themselves. The metal fatigue to the roof of the car is a serious concern. Despite the urgency, there is nothing they can do to work faster. One mistake spells disaster. The cable is passed through the windows, but will the roof of the car withstand the stress? Everyone holds their breath. It seemed like a long time. The time when we were alone, it felt very long. I was looking at the cable they had run through the car. I was holding on to it because I was afraid the roof of the car would open up and the car would fall, taking us with it. So the two of us were holding on. Miraculously, the car is lifted up and placed on solid ground. The nightmare is over. Mr. Van Der Vel walked me to the ambulance. I was clutching him. I didn't want to let go. I knew what he had done for my kids, and I just had the strength to thank him. Lorsqu'on s'est retrouvés, mon mari et moi, 
When we were finally alone, my husband and I, the first thing he asked me was, are you angry with me? <laughs> the thought didn't even cross my mind. All in all, I'm happy. Everything went well. With the fall of communism came the rise of terrorism in Russia, and with it one of the most violent cases of rescue in Russian history. In Moscow, international terrorist Mansour has barricaded himself in an apartment with two female hostages. On April 6, 1995, a passerby rushes to the observation post of the Government Automobile Inspection Bureau and tells the officer that he has just seen two people running along Petrovka Street. The first one is in handcuffs, and the one chasing him is hitting him. This information is immediately given to the officer on duty, Yurochkin, captain of militia. After we got here, I called my office and asked them to send some more militia, preferably with higher-ranking officers, to this address. Open up, militia! All of the efforts to enter the apartment turn out to be unsuccessful. The decision is made to call a special emergency unit. From the story of the escaped man, they find out that the criminals are heavily armed and that they are holding two more women in the apartment. The officers set up an assault force and attempt to contact the terrorists. At the same time, they determine the floor plan of the apartment and make plans in the event an attack becomes necessary. I'll give you two minutes to open the door. Surrender and release the hostages. After long and unsuccessful negotiations, the decision is made for an open assault. Please don't shoot! Don't shoot! I want you to surrender now! I had just stepped away from the door when a bullet came through. Come out now and you will live. I don't believe you. You'll kill me. I don't believe you. Killers. Suddenly, without warning, shots ring out from inside the apartment and one of the officers outside the door is wounded in the arm. As I was standing there, I felt the bullet came through my arm. I remember I got weak in my knees, but I didn't want to leave until I was sure that everything was under control. My superior noticed that I was wounded and he ordered me to be taken down to the ambulance. I order you to surrender. You have wounded an officer. Yeah. Put your hands behind your back and come out of the apartment. During the assault, Mansur would shout, I'm coming out, don't shoot. I need an attorney immediately. In the next second, he would shut down and start shooting again, shouting that there were a bunch of killers. I guess he was under the influence of alcohol or drugs, so we couldn't be sure of what exactly he was going to do next. So we broke down the door and went inside as fast as we could. Look for the hostages. You shoot the soldiers. Here, here, I found one. She's wounded. Mm 
Нашел вторую, ранена, помогите! The second hostage is severely wounded by the criminal. Despite all the efforts of the paramedics and the ER specialists, she dies at the hospital. Mansour is killed in the assault in spite of the ingenious defense system he had constructed inside the apartment. Many details of the operation cannot be disclosed in the interests of security. Through the determined efforts of the dedicated militiamen, one hostage was saved from the certain death that awaited her by the hand of this vicious killer. From, Aust from Austria comes an amazing story of luck and timing, an incredible high-tech rescue attempt to save a skier trapped beneath tons of snow in an icy underground river. On June 22, 1991, Michael, George, and Reiner are on a ski trip in the Austrian Alps they will never forget. On a ski slope near Innsbruck, Austria, Michael lets his friends take the lead. At an altitude of 6,000 feet, they suddenly realize that Michael has disappeared somewhere behind them. Michael isn't there anymore. Well, where is he? Let's go look for him. We have to go back. Both imagine the worst. They know that ten years ago, a married couple fell into an underground glacier river at this spot and died. There's his ski pole! There's his ski pole! Let's go for help! Still wearing his boots, Reiner runs down the mountain to the lodge. In situations like these, each moment can spell the difference between life or death. We need help. Our friend fell into a river. We need a helicopter. Hello, this is Alten Gasthof Riesens. We need a mountain rescue team and a helicopter immediately. Someone is trapped up there in the river. We need help urgently. Our friend fell into a water hole. We need mountain rescue and a helicopter as soon as possible. Please, hurry! Okay, we take it from here. Where is it? Okay, I'll let them know. Coincidentally, on this very day, there is a practice rescue operation being conducted in the vicinity of the accident by the mountain rangers of Rees. Due to the emergency call, practice turns into reality. Down in the valley, the rangers prepare for action. Only minutes after the emergency call, the first members of the rescue team arrive at the scene. We need to contact the base. We need reinforcements. We are going to need divers to go look for him. From Innsbruck, divers are called in.
I hear something. Suddenly, the high sensitivity listening device picks up a signal. Michael has been located. Dr. Michaela arrives at the scene. He is one of the most experienced rescuers in the Austrian Alps. My first impression when I arrived was there's no way anyone could get out of this alive. The chances of getting the victim out alive were very, very slim because we didn't know how far in he had fallen. He could have been anywhere from 30 to 150 feet under the snow. So we decided it would be better to go in from the top. We think he went in there. Start cutting a hole over there. Tenaciously, the men fight their way through the frozen snow. Is there time? Or has Michael already died from the fall or freezing cold? Finally, the divers arrive. Bring the probe over here. Try pushing it in. Still, no sign of life from Michael. Now they attempt to insert long metal probes into the snow. Miraculously, the young man has survived the terrifying 60-foot fall and is clinging semi-consciously to a rock. Let me try a little more to the left. Why don't I go down first and take a look and see if I can find him? Finally, Michael manages to grab the probe. There he is! There he is! He's pulling on it! We've got him, but we have to hurry. Peter, you have to send the diver in from the top. Lower me down from here, but be very careful. In a situation like that, you don't know what to expect. It's not a good feeling when you go into the unknown. When I was standing next to the hole, I thought there's no way anyone could survive this. He held on to me very tightly. That was his first reaction. I thought he won't make it much longer. We've got to get him out of here fast, as quickly as possible. Okay, he's conscious. He's hypothermic and probably has a broken leg. I need a second rope, but we have to do it fast because I don't think he can last much longer. After more than two hours, Michael is pulled out of his icy tomb with a fractured leg. Nearly hypothermic, his body temperature has dropped to 25 degrees Celsius, or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. We had to handle the victim very carefully. If he had stayed down there any longer, time would have run out for him very quickly. I would have given him no more than half an hour. After that, 
He would have lapsed into a coma, and to resuscitate him under those conditions would have been nearly impossible. To get him out alive gave us an unbelievable feeling of relief. You almost have no hope and then you manage to save him. It's overwhelming, it's indescribable. Everybody was relieved and happy that the rescue went so well. We all shook hands and were thankful the man survived. That this man is still alive is due to the fast reaction of the rescue team. Otherwise, he would have died for sure. After the accident, he was immediately flown to the University Hospital of Innsbruck. A short time later, fully recovered, he resumed his life, lucky to be released from the icy grip of the beautiful but dangerous mountains. What you are about to see is the most famous Rescue 911 episode of all time, the Charles Stewart murder case. During the fall of 1989, this terrifying real-life story made front-page headlines and almost ignited a race riot in Boston when Stewart falsely accused another man of murdering his wife. Rescue 911 was there with actual footage of this horrific crime. Warning. This footage contains scenes of a graphic nature and mature subject matter. Parental discretion advised. At 8.43 8 p.m., a man on a car phone called into the Massachusetts State Police's special cellular emergency line. Dispatcher Gary McLaughlin took the call. State Police Boston recorded an emergency 510. My wife's been shot, I've been shot. Where is this, sir? I, I have no idea. I'm off. Uh, I've been coming from Tremont, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. Two shooting victims in Tremont Street area in Boston. I went over to my desk at that time and picked up an extension phone of that cellular line. Immediately, Sergeant Dan Grabowski contacted the Boston City Police. And I picked up the hard line to Boston PD. It's a direct hard line to the police turret which is their communication section. Boston, Boston Police Dispatcher Brian Cunningham stayed on the line, but could send no help for the shooting victims until he got their location. Where are you right now, sir? Can you indicate to me? No, I don't know. I don't know. He, drove, he made us go to an abandoned area. OK, sir. Can you see out the windows? Can you tell me where you are, please? No. I don't know. I don't see any signs. Oh, God. Are you near Brigham Women's Hospital? No, we went straight through. What kind uh, of car do you have, sir? Pardon me? What kind of vehicle do you have? Toyota Cressida. Toyota Cressida? Toyota Cressida. It's, it's a... Are you in the city of Boston, though? Yes. Can you give me any indication where you might be? Any buildings? Ah, uh, no. Okay, has your wife been shot as well? Yes. In the head. In the head? Yeah, I, I ducked down. How far, how long ago did you leave bringing a women, sir? In what direction did oh, you leave? Two minutes, three minutes. Three, three minutes from Brigham Women's Center. Oh, okay, sir, bear with me now. Stand by. Stay on the phone with me. We were flying by the seat of appearance, for me anyway, with this particular mission. There was nothing could have prepared you for this particular type of call. This guy, this individual, this victim saying, I've been shot, my wife's been shot. Uh, I've got one problem. I don't know where the hell I am. What's your name, sir? Stuart. Chuck Stewart. If you can drive, sir, without hurting yourself, yes, if you could. Just try to give me a cross street. If you can drive, give me any street indication and stay there. I'll get someone right to you, uh, to you right away. Stop the car. He took the keys, but I have a spare set. Okay. Oh, man. Bear with me, Chuck. I'm going to get someone to you. Hang in with me now. All right. I'm, I'm at a place. Oh, I can't read it. 
Just try to re read it, Chuck. Right, I'm coming up to a, an intersection, but there's no... Toyota Cressida. What color is your car, buddy? Street sign. Blue. Blue Toyota Cressida. Blue. Yeah. Oh. Okay, Chuck, so try to give me a street sign. Okay, Chuck. Is your wife breathing? I just feel it gurgling. There's a busy street up ahead. Oh, man. I'm turning onto a busy street. I, I recognize where I am now. Should I drive to the hospital? Just tell me what the, what the street is, Chuck. Oh, I'm pulling over. Tremont Street. Tremont Street? I can't hear you. Chuck. We had Huntington Avenue, Tremont Street, which are both lengthy streets. We had no idea other than that. That's Huntington and Tremont. I've worked in Rock Street for about five or six years. I knew all the uh, areas, alleys, most of the doorways, hallways in that area. I put the Bravo 101, the Bravo 104, and the Bravo 201 on call. He dispatched police to the general vicinity. Chuck. Where are you, buddy? Tremont Street. And what else? Trem Cash sign. Tremont Street, and what sign? Hang in with me, Chuck. Can you hear me? Chuck. Yeah. Wh Tremont Street, where? I don't know. I'm in front of K. Uh, K what? Oh, man. Hang in, Chuck. Come on with me now. Chuck, I need you to help me a little bit, and I'll get assistance to you right away. We're on the way, Chuck. Chuck. Yeah. Can you? I'm going to pass out. Uh, can you open the door? Can you open the window? I'm blanking out. You can't blank out on me. I, I need you, man. Chuck. Yeah, there is, my wife has stopped gurgling. She stopped breathing. Right, Chuck, I'm going to get assistance to you, buddy. Open the door. Talk to someone on the street. Despite his articulate behavior, he was. we were losing him to a point where you could tell he was obviously losing blood, getting a little shocky on us. Like, time was your enemy. You were in a battle of time. Open the door and talk to anyone that passes by, my friend. All right, there's no one by. Anybody at all, I want to talk to somebody, find out exactly where you are. All right, all right, all right. All right, oh, brother. Man. Oh, man. Uh, you hang in there with me. We're going to take care of this now. Help's on the way. Talk to me, Chuck. Oh. Where were you shot, Chucky? Chuck? No, he's faded. No, he's faded out. We'll get nothing from him at all. Nothing. Chuck. Chuck. Chuck, are you there? We heard body movement in the vehicle. We heard uh, breathing in the vehicle. We believe the victim to still be with us. So all we had was verbal stimulus in an attempt to rouse him and, and uh, give him some incentive to let him know that we were uh, still plugging for him. It was difficult. That was my most difficult part of the mission was when we lost uh, a verbal communication when he blacked out. Chuck Stewart. Chuck, can you hear me? Minutes Chuck. passed, and still Charles Chuck, said nothing. Phone, Chuck. Hey, wait a minute. Sirens over there. You hear the siren? I can hear a siren. Yeah, uh, Boston, we just heard a siren on the cellular line. I advised the dispatcher at the Boston turret. Uh, there had to be a cruiser right within the immediate area for me to hear that siren. He uh, shut down all the sirens of, of all the sector cars that he had out there. Negative. Negative on the siren. And then one by one, had each vehicle turn their siren on. Chuck, pick up the phone. They're, they're putting on individual sirens. Right. Well, to one your sirens on. No siren there. No, we're not getting anything now. Bravo two one, shut off your siren. Bravo K one, sound your siren. Not yet. No siren. Bravo K1, shut off your siren. Bravo 1 4, sound your siren. I think it was like the fourth or fifth car that uh, we did hear the siren. You're right there, right on top of it. We hear the siren, loud, real loud, right there. St. Alphonsus. What he did is flood that sector with vehicles when it was a matter of, uh, I don't know, seconds, uh, they found the car. Okay, they can. You locate them. You've got them. All right. When the police finally arrived, it was just uh, a total relief that uh, he does have help there now, and it's out of our hands. 
seven, uh, you can show me on our map. The instant the Stewart's blue sedan was located, EMS Deputy Superintendent Richard Serino and dozens of other emergency workers converged on the scene. The first paramedics to arrive were partners Dan Hickey and Kevin Shea. I got out of the ambulance, grabbed some equipment, made my way over to the driver's side of the car, which was closest to me. My partner Dan went around to the other side to uh, attend to the woman. She had a substantial amount of uh, injury to her head and was in cardiac arrest at that time. He was saying, you know, take care of my wife, how's my wife? And I didn't know how his wife was. I suspected that she was seriously injured and that she was in worse condition than he was. He was very conversant and, and lucid and giving the Boston police officers quite a bit of information about what had transpired. And um, I was impressed with how how much detail and how much recall he had, um, considering what he had been through. For Chuck, it was the golden hour, but for Carol, it was the golden 10 minutes because she was pregnant. Uh, in order to, uh, for an attempt to save the child, she had to get to a hospital that could deliver the baby in 10 minutes um, in order to have a chance at the baby's life. Two people shot. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say it's a fairly common occurrence these days. It's not a very rare situation where someone is injured by gunfire these days. So my only concern is what I have to do at that point to keep him alive to get him to the hospital. PCH? Yeah, this one's going to city. The other one went to the uh, Brigham, OK? This is going to the city? City, yep. Yeah. 29 year old Charles Stewart and his 30 year old wife Carol were rushed to separate hospitals with separate gunshot wounds. At Brigham and Women's Hospital, where they had attended a childbirth class only minutes before, their baby was delivered by cesarean section eight weeks prematurely. Charles was taken to Boston City Hospital. Okay. What hurts? Oh, oh, what hurts? Oh, oh, oh. Okay. How about numbness or tingling in your legs? No. Oh. No? Okay. Where are you? Uh, 12, 18, 59, 29 years old. Okay. Okay, you want to see another hospital that they would do it on That hurt, buddy? Your belly hurt? It just feels tight. It just feels tight. That hurts when I press? Okay, so he'll go up. She went to another hospital. We can't keep an update because we're taking care of you, okay? Okay. All right. Are you putting in a chest of the Is there someone you want us to call for you? I'm not putting a chest of it. I want the x ray. Uh, okay. Charles, yeah. is there someone you want us to call for you? No. No? No. Okay, so, so far we have uh, two penetrating gunshot wounds. It looks like an entrance wound here. Second site over here. Patients seem dynamically stable, complaining of belly tenderness. We're going to get a, uh, some x-rays of his chest, shoot a quick picture of his kidneys, and then we'll go up to the operating room. Uh, Dr. James Feldman assessed Charles Stewart's condition in the emergency room. He had very severe injuries. He had significant abdominal injuries, um, which were life-threatening. If there were a delay in either finding him or in any phase of his treatment, then he could have died from these. And hopefully, uh, he will, will not.
about that. About two months ago, I don't know. Okay, Mr. Stewart, this is just oxygen, all right? All right. I just want you to breathe normally. Are you ready? Yeah. Chief of Surgery Erwin Hirsch performed the six-hour operation. The bullet had traversed the abdomen diagonal way. So there are a lot of things in the path of that bullet. The liver had to be, parts had to be removed, and blood vessels and intestines that were bleeding, and that had to be controlled. And as you do that, you begin to identify other injuries. It was a serious injury, yes. Required expert care, yes. But he should be able to be uh, fully rehabilitated. It may take some time, but the, down the line, uh, he should be able to do just about everything that he did before. But Carol Stewart died within hours of being admitted to the hospital. And 17 days later, their baby Christopher would follow. The day after the shooting, the dispatchers were inundated with praise for their extraordinary efforts to locate the stewards. Well, very proud of you guys. It's a pleasure, My pleasure, Governor. I never considered uh, our role as, as a heroic role. Uh, the individual hero in this case uh, was Mr. Stewart. The gut and the grizzle and the savvy this man had, just the will to live to keep on going, uh, is incredible. I'm not a hero. Uh, I try to do what I'm paid to do. Uh, there is emotion involved, and I, I certainly empathize with the person. I hope, uh, I wish him the best. I, I, I would like to say I'm sorry to him for what he suffered. Hundreds of mourners attended Carol Stewart's funeral, including Charles's brothers, Matthew and Michael, and many dignitaries. But Charles himself, was still recuperating in the hospital. Following is a message from Chuck to his wife, Carol. Good night, sweet wife, my love. God has called you to his hands, not to take you away from me, all the happiness and gladness you brought, but to bring you away from the cruelty and violence that fills this world. In our souls, we must forgive this sinner, because he would too. Now you sleep away from me, I will never again know the feeling of your hand in mine, but I will always feel you, I miss you, and I love you, your husband Chuck. Days went by and no suspect was arrested. Pressure mounted to find the black man Charles Stewart had described as having robbed and then shot him and his pregnant wife. Police focused on a suspect. Shortly after Charles picked the man out of a lineup, his brother Matthew Stewart came forward and made a startling revelation to the authorities. Matthew's attorney, John Perini, explained. What he's told me was that he found it difficult to believe that his brother had been robbed uh, by the person subsequently charged on Mission Hill that evening uh, when the items claimed to have been taken in the robbery were, were in the bag, which was tossed to him by his brother Chuck on the evening of October 23rd, 1989. Soon after Matthew Stewart admitted he had had some involvement and that his brother Charles had apparently had some involvement as well, District Attorney Newman Flanagan held a press conference. After a careful review of this new evidence, I instructed Boston Police homicide detectives to arrest Charles Stewart for the murder. Television news reporter Miles O'Brien followed the case from the beginning. This whole story blew open then. And the anger came from the black community, rightly so. The case did not go forward in the manner that it should. They were too preoccupied with the story that Charles Stewart gave, which is now a total fabrication. And because of that, hundreds of black males were harassed. They were, felt that shot. Willie Bennett had been used in a very insidious way, and he had. But we were all duped. We wanted to believe this story because he was a victim. He was seriously shot. The morning after Charles Stewart was identified as a suspect, his abandoned car was found on a 300-foot-high bridge. 
and his body was pulled out of the icy water below. Chuck Stewart was buried, and the governor wasn't there, and the mayor wasn't there, and there weren't 800 people there. It was a very different funeral from Carol Stewart's funeral. And this entire area was grieving in a different way this time. Charles Stewart's apparent involvement in the murder of his own wife and child was particularly difficult for all the people who had worked so hard to save his life. It was uh, an, an unsettling... Uh a call to take uh, and you try, try to put it behind you unfortunately with the media attention the team really hasn't had a chance to put uh, the mission uh, behind us and that's normally what you do you have to do otherwise you couldn't perform effectively you couldn't emotionally perform effectively if you kept the the image of that night and that mission uh, always in the, the back of your mind I'm sure 10 years from now I remember every detail about this call there are other calls that a month ago, you wouldn't remember too much about it, but this'll, this'll be with me forever. I think it'll be with uh, anybody who was there, anybody who saw the picture, anybody who saw any of your footage. I'm sure we'll think about this. Even though Mr. Stewart now has become the principal of the case, uh, I don't think I would change anything that happened that night as far as what we did. Uh, we accomplished uh, what we were put here to do that evening. Somebody asked me uh, some time ago if I would be happy when all this is over. And my answer then was the same as today, that there's absolutely no happiness in anything in this case. This is a, it's a total tragedy. On January 25th, Carol DeMady Stewart's parents and brother announced the formation of a scholarship fund in her name for people in the inner city area mistakenly targeted in the search for her killer. She was truly the brightest of lights in our lives. A light that never go out in our minds. She will always and forever be with us. Mere words cannot express the terrible emptiness we feel Oh, how much we miss her now. We pray that God has taken her and our beloved grandson, Christopher, into his embrace in heaven, where they will be safe and happy with him until the time we will join them. Thank you. Maybe the effort by uh, Carol's parents, uh, that is the aspirin that's going to begin the healing process. But there's going to be a scar. Uh, how significant the scar, that's for historians to look five years or ten years down as this case plays itself out, which it hasn't played itself out yet. Many questions remain unanswered. How much involvement does Matthew Stewart have in all of this? That's the big question. Who pulled the trigger is the biggest question. A lot will be told, and we might never know. We might never know.